another Cavley conversation. Um, my name's Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Arthur Carter Institute of Journalism, where I direct the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and also the Science Communication Workshops. And we are absolutely thrilled to have a great crowd here today and also online, those of you who are joining us online. Uh, and we have uh, a really important uh, discussion uh, on the agenda today and two wonderful speakers and our usual amazing moderator. Uh, Robert Lee Holtz of the Wall Street Journal, will, as always, uh, will do uh, formal introductions, but I just wanted to say personally uh, how glad I am and appreciative I am that Beth Macy and uh, Travis Reeder could join us. Yeah. They have both written extraordinary books. Uh, some of you who are here in person uh, have the opportunity to buy them uh, from our, our, our friend uh, Charlie. Uh, but in any case, we will get to hear them uh, speak about this topic that in some ways feels, feels like it's yesterday's news, but it is anything but. Uh, it's uh, more important than ever. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Lee uh, for the formal introductions uh, and to get things going. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dan. So welcome uh, to the Cavalry Conversation on Science Communication. And I should note right up front that this is a, an evening's exploration made possible by support from the Cavalry Foundation and the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program of which uh, Dan is director. Just to tell you what's coming up for the rest of the fall here on October 29th, uh, we'll be delving into the power of the image in science uh, journalism, science storytelling, with uh, a very uh, special and renowned National Geographic photographer, Lynn Johnson, uh, most recently a Publisher Prize finalist for her remarkable photo essay on a space transplant, and Wesleyan visual historian Jennifer Tucker, and then uh, to uh, conclude, we're going to have a very special session on November 12th. We'll be having a screening of the new documentary uh, called Bias uh, by filmmaker Robin Hauser, who will be joining us to talk about um, this feature length film on uh, implicit bias. And to make it particularly interesting, we'll then be joined by uh, pioneering Harvard social psychologist uh, Mazrin Bajani, um, who will then actually do interactive testing on uh, implicit bias with us in the audience as a way of framing a conversation on this very powerful but very subtle uh, influence on our behavior and choices. And these all will be webcast, uh, as is tonight, and I welcome uh, those of you who are watching us uh, indirectly. I encourage everyone, both here and there, I don't know why I point to the ceiling when I, um, <laughs> they have wings, um, uh, to uh, chime in with your questions. This is a conversation, uh, not a lecture, and those of you who are watching online can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag uh, Cavalry Convo. So it's hard to find the right way to jump in to the topic tonight, opioids. Every day, uh, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, more than 130 people in the United States die after overdosing on opioids. Uh, in 2016, just in that year, that was 42,000 people who died. This past August, Johnson & Johnson uh, was ordered to pay $572 million for contributing to just Oklahoma's opioid addiction crisis. Um, they're by no means the largest pharmaceutical uh, company involved in this. The point is that was the cost of just one year's treatment and abatement, $572 million in one not so heavily populated state in our union. The uh, state prosecutors had actually thought uh, abatement coverage for 20 years, but they were bargained down. In Oklahoma alone, in 2015, more than 326 million opioid pills were dispensed just in that state. That was enough for every adult in Oklahoma 
to have a prescription for 110 pills, whether they needed them or not. And that Oklahoma case is just one of 2,000 lawsuits currently pending brought by state and local governments uh, seeking to hold drug makers, retail pharmacies, uh, and uh, distributors accountable. And that, as many of you may know, includes uh, Purdue Pharma, which makes OxyContin, and uh, uh, the members of the family of the Sacklers that uh, own that company. Uh, we've just recently reported, I think just last week, that, that those people receive something on the order of between 12 and $13 billion profit for that legal drug operation. Now, we're very, very fortunate. Beth Macy uh, comes to us from Roanoke, Virginia tonight. Uh, Travis Reeder <coughs> joins us from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore for what is going to be a conversation about opioids, about addiction, about dependence, about profit and pain, and about how a cure can become a lethal epidemic. Beth, as many of you may know, is a journalist of some note, an author, an award-winning writer. In 2010, she was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. Her first published book, Factory Man, was a national bestseller. So was her second book, True Vine. And her third, which we'll talk about tonight, Dope Sick, debuted as number six on the New York Times nonfiction list. And earlier this year, I'm pleased to say, was named the winner of the Los Angeles Times Science and Technology Book Prize. She also writes essays, op-eds for the New York Times, among others, magazines, she does radio, she podcasts now, <laughs> as, as so many of us do. <laughs> Travis is a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics, where he directs the Master's of Bioethics degree program. Now, as a philosopher and an ethicist, a, a trained logician, I need to be careful this evening, He's written broadly on climate change, on medical resuscitation issues, adoption, nanotechnology, and his interest in opioids came about abruptly after a motorcycle accident when he took too many pills for too long and found himself dealing with a profound opioid dependency. And he's the author of a new book called In Pain, which we'll be talking about tonight, a bioethicist's personal struggle with opioids. Now, so I want to start with a, a question for both of you. So this is a medical story. This is a business story. This is a big pharma story, a legal story, an ethics story, a pain management story, a cautionary tale of substance abuse. I mean, what kind of story is this opioid epidemic, Beth? It's a family story. I think we've left it in this nation to the institution of the American family to deal with the worst drug epidemic uh, in our history. And as uh, so many people fall through the cracks and can't get access to treatment or get access to the wrong treatment for many, many dollars, uh, it is often the family that's left um, paying the price for this, whether they're still struggling with their person with opioid use disorder or they've lost them. Travis, how would you answer that question? What kind of story is this for you? Uh, it's a story about pain. Uh, it's a story about a country in pain, a country trying to treat all different kinds of pain, about pain that comes about when the treatment for pain goes awry, um, and then the sort of pain that we're dealing with now where you know, I would hazard a guess that almost everybody in here you know, is no more than a degree of separation away from somebody who's been affected by substance use disorder, overdose, addiction. Um, so yeah, what, what it really ties it together for me is that um, Americans are just suffering really terribly and uh, we, we really need to figure out why. How did you come to this story, Beth? I was a, a longtime newspaper reporter for the Roanoke Times. I worked there for 25 years and um, I wrote about family issues and normally I wrote about um, kind of marginalized communities, veterans with PTSD, refugees, immigrants. I did kind of hard hitting investigative enterprise pieces. Um, but the story I started working on in 2012 was kind of 
my first introduction to this. And, the, and it was interesting because I normally wrote about things in the inner city, but with this case, um, this heroin cell, if you will, of users had popped up in a very wealthy suburb called Hidden Valley, ironically Hidden Valley, because um, boy, they sure hid it and they had the money to hide it. Um, and it made front page news because a young man who was a private school student, mom was a well-known civic leader, was about to go to prison for his role in selling the heroin that um, resulted in his former private school classmate's death. And I wrote this three-part series, on, ran on the front page, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and readers kind of- Of the Roanoke paper. Of the Roanoke mm -hmm. paper in 2012, and readers kind of spit their coffee up and went, what? Wealthy white kids are doing heroin? We had no idea. Um, so that was the start of it, and then when I decided uh, to pitch it as my third book, I did what I normally do, which is I take advantage of my contacts. I've reported, I'm kind of a unicorn in journalism in that I've reported from the same community for 30 years. So I went back to those folks that I met. I went back, I had, I had stayed in touch with Spencer, the young man in prison, via uh, the prison system email. Stayed in touch with his mother, the mother of the person who OD'd. And then I went back to the prosecutors and I said, what's going on now? And after about an hour, I could see a book it was huge, and this is 2015. And then um, that was the year that Deaton and Case, the Nobel winning economist, published their groundbreaking study showing that for the first time in American history, life expectancy was going down. And that was largely driven by overdose deaths, uh, predominantly opioids, but also so-called diseases of despair, uh, suicide, and cirrhosis of the liver, and things like that. And so it just turned into a, uh, a much bigger story, and so I did what I always did, do, try to do, is I went really deep in um, three different communities in Virginia, because that's kind of what I can bring to the table, and then tried to use those as a microcosm for what was happening all across the country. And so, Travis, I asked the same question to you. How did you come to this story? Um, uh, not in a very nice way. I got hit by a van <laughs> on my <laughs> motorcycle. Uh, yeah, I mean, so prior to 2015, I was working on very different things. I wasn't mm -hmm. researching pain, I wasn't researching opioids, any of this stuff. I was working on climate change and sustainability. Um, and I went out for a motorcycle ride on Memorial Day weekend, and there's about three blocks from my house, and a young man uh, just didn't see me. He pulled through an intersection without stopping and T-boned my motorcycle and crushed my foot. <laughs> And so the, this like, very strange series of events happened, which is I'm a bioethicist by profession. I work at Johns Hopkins. My job is to think about ethical and policy issues that arise in medicine and healthcare, the healthcare system. And then I was inducted into this healthcare system as a patient. Mm -hmm. So I you know, wake up in a trauma bay. They tell me I'm gonna lose my foot. I, invest, I, I start with a series of mini surgeries that thankfully was able to save my foot, but meant that I was going to be in the hospital medicated for quite a long time. And, um, and I ended up developing over the course of about two months this, this really, as you said, profound dependence on opioids. And, and then bad advice led me to wean too aggressively and I went into terrible withdrawal. And so I, I now think of it as, um, I really don't recommend this for anyone who's like looking for a way as a writer to like find your next <laughs> <Well> subject. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a great way to find a research program, but it turns out it worked. Um, and so when I came out of withdrawal, which maybe we'll talk about more or not, yeah. um, but I, I spent four weeks in just hellacious opioid withdrawal. And when I came out, I took some time to kind of gain some distance from the trauma of the experience. Mm. And then my partner and I very slowly started to share this secret, this intimate, personal story with people close to us. And it didn't take very long before people were like, you know, you're a bioethicist. <laughs> you kind of think about these things for a living. Uh, and so I started writing, and that was four years ago, and that's basically all I've done since. I'm curious, though, at what point did you decide as an academic? One of the things that strikes me about the two of you is that you're approaching this as we intend in these conversations from vastly different vantages. Uh, Beth, you're a classic community-based journalist, and you, sir, are 
um, as you say, a bioethicist. You are an academic with, you know, tenure issues, and you're looking for peer-reviewed publications. At what point did you decide, Travis, that you were Exhibit A in a book about opioids, and how did that shape how you wrote what is, in many ways, a policy book? I if I may, yeah, I, I say that in no way to, to discount it. It's a, it's a fascinating and compelling book, and and uh, but you, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, because you two have to play by different rules. We do. That's right. Um, and so this was uh, a work of memoir combined with scholarship in a way, right? I, I wanted to use my story as a vehicle to get people to understand so, some pretty difficult concepts. You know, how does the brain work and, and what do opioids do and how do they get us in trouble and how does that explain what's happening in the country and then how do we solve it? Right? These are actually pretty hard issues and so I wanted to use my story as a vehicle. But the answer to your question of when I decided, I suppose is something like when I decided I was willing to risk my career. Because <laughs> um, as you say, uh, it's not a peer reviewed publication in JAMA, right? Uh, I, d I had to decide whether to write for everybody or to write for my colleagues. And I very much care about writing for my colleagues and being held to the standard of rigorous scholarship. Um, but I also recognize that having 12 people with PhDs read something that I wrote doesn't always enact the change that I want, uh, and this story felt like it's the sort of thing that we should talk about together. Um, and so I decided to take a chance. Luckily, they haven't fired me yet, so <laughs> I, I think they're okay with it so far. Yeah. Well, no, but it's interesting because one of the things, as part of these casually conversations that we're very interested in is these days, for lots of obvious um, reasons of communications technology, more and more researchers, more and more people who are in medicine or in science um, are themselves able and eager to take their own stories, their own work directly to the public. But there's a whole different set of professional risks and professional barriers. One thing I was very curious about, I wanna, would be interested in hearing the two of you talk about how you were able or not able to approach sources and the kinds of relationships that you were able or not able uh, to develop. Uh, Travis, I'd like you to answer that first and, and then Beth, I, I'll ask you about it. So as an academic, you have to live by a different set of rules than a journalist, conventionally speaking. Tell us about that. That's right. So one of the things is that if I were going out and collecting stories, for me, that would be considered empirical research. So it would be qualitative data collection. I'd have to get IRB approval. And a really important feature is that I'm not an empirical scientist. Um, so I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do it responsibly. It would have taken co-authorship. And so one of the reasons to, to use my story, and then when I was able to find in the literature, um, to show that it's not unique, to show that it's not I'm not an outlier, I'm, I'm every person, right? Um, I had to find that in the literature because I wasn't able to go out and do data collection. That would have been irresponsible of me. I'm not trained as a journalist and I'm not trained as an empirical scientist. Um, so yeah, so it was a very different sort of project and um, that probably gets to some of what you're asking about, that it led me to be very, very candid with my own experience because that's what I had to work with, right? I had my experience and what's in the literature, and so I had to eventually decide not to hold anything back. Did you worry about embarrassing yourself in front of your colleagues? Oh yeah, all the time, I still do. Um, yeah, no, it was terrifying, and I did it for the first time in 2017. In January in 2017, I published a paper that was in an academic journal, but it included a, a piece of my personal story. Um, and they really appreciated the writing, you know, hey, people read this, and, and as, as academic things go, it kind of went viral in the medical <laughs> community. Yeah, um, yeah. Hundreds of people read it. Uh, <laughs> but that really is what changed my career because I, I joke about, you know, whether I had to worry about tenure, I have a lot of support at my institution, especially from my director, and um, there's recognition, there's growing recognition, not enough and not fast enough, but there's recognition that we need to talk to everybody, and academia can't be an ivory tower that's purely insular, yeah. So Beth, you're coming to this now from your vantage point as a community-based journalist. Um, 
you know your way around, you know, the nonfiction part. But this is um, a really, from a sourcing standpoint, from a relationship standpoint, mm -hmm. very challenging. How did you approach um, developing your sources? So the first thing I said, when, as I would meet people that were maybe going to be subjects of my book, I would say, I would just be totally transparent. I would say, uh, I don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm working on a proposal. I mean, just be honest about the littlest thing. I'm working on an article for my NYU class. I'm not sure if it's going to be published or not. Um, and I started casting my net wide. I went back to those original sources. And then a friend of mine found a dog running loose one day. So she calls me up and she says, Beth, I just returned a dog to a household that's in total disarray because here's this woman in her 60s, a young grandmother, a, a, a hospital nurse, doesn't know whether she could leave her heroin addicted daughter home alone with a newborn baby. And she, the dog got loose, my friend Elizabeth returns the dog. And she says, my friend Elizabeth is quite a character. And she says, uh, oh, my friend Beth is thinking about writing a book about heroin. Would you be interested in talking to her? <laughs> and she'll look after your dog. Yeah, no. Right? What, what? No, Seriously, literally, yeah. literally, she said that. And they said, yes, because nobody knows how, nobody understands what a hard place we're in. Like, I don't even know if I can go to work. She can't get her medicine she's trying to get. Um, if she loses custody of her baby, then she's going to lose her Medicaid. I mean, there were just all these complicating factors. And so I waited a few weeks, and my friend Elizabeth kept saying, did you call them back? Did you call them back? And I said, no. So I went, and I just, and they were familiar with my first book. So that really? helped. I mean, I've been okay. a journalist in that town for mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and her dad knew my work, and um, they're divorced. And so I just said, look, I'm writing a book proposal. I don't know if you'll be in it or not, but, uh, but I will let you know along the way. I, I know I, you can teach me a lot about this issue. And, and she did. And at the end of that first conversation, which, which was with Tess Henry, the mm. young heroin addicted uh, mother, and her, her mom, Patricia, it was three hours long. They told me the whole story. And I said, would you mind if uh, I'd like to have a way to touch base with you on a regular basis so I can see how your story unfolds? All I ask of you is that you be completely honest with me and I'll do the same. Um, and as and I did that. As I knew that they were going to be a major part of the book, I would be in touch with them. Um, but I said, could we do a weekly check-in? Like, is there something you do every week? She said, well, I'm supposed to go to NA meetings. It's a condition of my medication-assisted treatment. And, but I don't have a car. And I said, well, can I drive you? Can I drive you? And I'll interview you on the way. And she said, sure. And so I would, with her permission, record, put my mm -hmm. iPhone in my cup holder mm -hmm. and record our conversations. And I would walk her baby around in the back of the room when he got fussy. And um, th in that way, I mm -hmm. got to see her as she was struggling with this. And then eventually, um, definitely fall through the gaps of care and ended up homeless, prostituting for drugs, lost custody of her son, lost her access to her insurance, sent to a very expensive rehab center that didn't allow her to take her medicine, and eventually she was murdered two and a half years after I met her. Her body was discovered at the bottom of a dumpster by another homeless person addicted to heroin who was foraging for cans to sell for drugs. And I will just say that like I got the call on the day after Christmas from her mother was sobbing. She said, I'm so sorry to have to make this call. This is a call I never want to make. And she's apologizing to me. And because we had been through so much together at that point. And I didn't know what to do. Like what do you do when the main person you've been following for two and a half years is murdered, and um, I called a friend of mine. She said, you should just put your notebook down and be a friend. And so then I thought, well, what do I do? What do I do? What would I do if this was a friend? Um, mm -hmm. So I made soup, which felt totally stupid, <laughs> uh, impotent, and uh, not effective at all. But it made me feel better, and I took it up there. And she actually was hiking on the trails at the moment, and I saw her son. but. Um, 
the next day she asked me if I would go to the funeral home and she said, well, it wasn't the next day, it was actually a week later, she said goodbye to her daughter's body, which it had taken funeral home technicians two days for her to, pre to prepare her to be mm. uh, uh, witnessable. Open and casket. Yeah, yeah, just, just, this was just the goodbye for the mother and the grandfather. Yeah. And again, I just had my notebook out and I, I didn't want her to forget that I was a reporter, but also I had to be a human first, you know? So that's what I did. And then things happened, like there was one moment where Tess wanted me to pick her up out of a drug house and I decided that was a line I couldn't cross. Well, both of you in different ways have written incredibly intimate accounts um, and it's part of the power of your versions of this story, your, your, your vantage points. But as a, as a journalistic matter, um, as a craft matter, um, uh, as you've just demonstrated, you grew incredibly close to th these very damaged people that you were covering. At what point did you, I know you've told us you make soup, but have you really put down your notebook? mentally. How do you hold on to your journalistic objectivity in a moment like that? Well, I think you have to be a human being first, right? Like, that's why we're here. Um, and so I did the best I could. As I said, I did have my notebook out the next time I saw her, but that day I just made her soup and I took it to her house. and. And I was there for her as she wanted me to drive her to the funeral home. And um, you know, it was an interesting family dynamic. I was there when they picked out the urn um, recording with my notebook uh, and my phone, as I had been all along. So that was still there as a reminder. Um, and did I cross the line? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there were moments where I had to make a decision and I would just tell the reader, like, she asked me to pick her up from a drug house and I didn't know what to do. And I talked to my husband about it and told her mother instead that that's where she was and her recovery coach. Um, I felt like transparency was key in that situation. Mm -hmm. But some people might say, yeah, but you took her to the meetings before and yet when she really needed you, when, you know, you didn't go get her. Did you seek counseling? I did, I did. Uh, before the book came out, um, I was really having trouble sleeping. Um, my doctor thought maybe I had PTSD. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine who, by the way, wrote the definition for PTSD, <laughs> the psychiatrist, Frank Ockberg. He said, I don't think you have it, I think you have secondary trauma, and he suggested mm. I, I go to counseling, mm -hmm. and I did. Yeah, it is, it is interesting increasingly, at least in the last year or two, um, journalists at, at mainstream publications who cover distressing events are, are being offered counseling. And it's, a, it's a real uh, professional shift in attitudes toward how w covering crises affects the people who cover them. I'd like to just shift the subject for a second. Um, in addition to the remarkable personal stories that you share with us through your books. I mean, yours is a personal, personal story, and yours the personal stories of the uh, people who are dependent, the people who are addicted in the communities. But both of you, each in your own way, identify a supply chain uh, and a larger um, uh, set of uh, influences working on this. And you each bring I have to say the sort of the it's quite interesting the vantages of your professional character. I mean, and uh, I wonder, um, Travis, when you look at the opioid epidemic, um, opioid crisis, whatever you want. I mean, you're very strong on the idea that what you're looking at is dependence uh, that takes place in a formal medical setting with you know doctors who are trying to do the right thing and pharmacists who don't want to give you any more than you've uh, been assigned, any more pills than you've been prescribed. Um, from that vantage point, 
I mean, can, can, you, can you tell us what the problem is here? I mean. Well, I, I guess it depends on which problem you're pointing to, right? Um, well, I have five fingers, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was inducted into the healthcare system, and so the first problem that I saw had to do with what happened to me, right? And it was this very intimate story of carelessness among some of my prescribers. And, you know, I was treated at world class institutions. I mean, the fact that I have a foot is a miracle. Um, like just so you understand, they took a piece of my thigh and made it part of my foot. Like these, these are magicians, as far as I can tell. Um, and yet, I had more than 12 clinicians writing me prescriptions in three hospitals mm -hmm. over the course of two months, and none of them knew, me, knew how to get me off the medications they prescribed. And that was the thing that I just couldn't get over. In the wake of the withdrawal, in the wake of the trauma that my family experienced as I sunk to the depths and eventually started thinking about killing myself to escape this pain, we finally get away from that and I think, how can that happen? Like, how in the world did we get here? How did we get to a place where we are so bad at the pain medication that we use every day that the world-class doctors who put me back together couldn't figure out how to get me off the medication that they prescribed? And that was actually the subject of my first essay that I put in this health policy journal. It was this very particular claim. It was, look docs, look NPs, look clinicians. If you put a patient on uh, a drug that has predictable long-term side effects, you're on the hook. Like you have entered into a relationship that comes with obligations and this is the most obvious thing I've ever said in my career. <laughs> and, and apparently it needed said, right? It because did. Yeah, totally. because to this day, most clinicians don't understand that. They'll prescribe benzodiazepines and opioids, not to mention SSRIs and SNRIs, all of these drugs that cause physiological dependence and cause withdrawal when you take them away without knowing how to taper them. So that was the first thing that I found. And it was a fairly acute, fairly describable problem. And, and then what really happened was I, I started looking at the healthcare system and trying to figure out how we got here. And then it just exploded because the answer is so complicated and raises so many problems that we aren't just recklessly over prescribing opioids. It turns out now we're also under prescribing them. And so we've got people in desperate chronic pain who are being denied a uh, medication that they probably ought to be prescribed because we're so afraid of all this overprescribing that's killing people. Um, we have patients who are on long-term me uh, medication who are stable, who are being abruptly cut off because doctors are afraid of the DEA. And so the problem is a hundred times more complicated than I thought when I saw this tiny little slice. And then you go a little bit further out and there are two and a half million people more struggling in America with opioid use disorder. And whatever we do with the healthcare system, like suppose I'm elected king of the world tomorrow and like fix healthcare and everyone listens to me and suppose I get it right, right? It doesn't solve the opioid crisis because the cat's out of the bag. Still have those 2.6 million. Exactly, people are struggling with addiction right now who are either going to die when they take, they take their next dose of fentanyl-laced heroin or not. And all of those are different components of the problem and trying to figure out like what the problem is when it comes to pain and opioids and drugs is, um, is just incredibly messy because there are all these different pieces. So Beth, you come at it again, as I keep harping, from your perspective as a seasoned journalist. What's the problem from your standpoint? Travis is talking about a medical education pain management, clinical ignorance uh, problem. What's the problem that you found? Well, um, I trace the, the whole beginnings of the opioid epidemic back to the introduction of OxyContin in 1996 and Purdue's um, uh, unethical, <laughs> Criminal misbranding, they um, uh, uh, eventually admitted guilt to. Uh, exaggerating uh, the safety of the drug and downplaying the risks, right? So they hire an army of uh, sales reps to go all over the country, but they pay, they pay particular attention to impoverished places where there tend to be high uh, instances of workplace injuries, like coal mining towns, logging, fishing villages. These, this, these are my people. This is where I work from, right? So, um, and 
when you put that opioid uh, that the, you've got all these reps going to these towns where people are also uh, losing their jobs, they have legitimate injuries, many of them, and the doctors are lied to, they're told the drug is safe when it isn't. Um, then you have people who are getting genuinely addicted, but in these poor communities, uh, they're also seeing Oxycontin as a way to pay their bills. They can get, uh, they can go to multiple doctors, especially in those early years, can get, they call it, they'll write you, uh, and uh, then they can sell half and take half, and that became a way, it became like modern day moonshining, you know? So modern this, day moonshining. Modern day moonshining, a way, a side hustle, right? Uh, and a way to pay the bills. And um, mm. crime in these impoverished communities uh, takes off shortly after the introduction of OxyContin. Almost every family I interviewed remembered the day we started locking our doors. We had never locked our doors before. I mean, there was a, a man making a night deposit at the bank, was shot and killed, so somebody who was addicted to OxyContin could get drugs to get more. Just crime of another level. The jails were full. And all this is happening in the late 90s and early aughts. I mean, this is before most people in America knew word one about the opioid crisis. And um, I felt lucky because I'm from Roanoke, and um, that is actually the place where the f nascent federal <laughs> investigation began in the early 2000s that um, ended with the uh, criminal misbranding misbranding Purdue, uh, a plea by Purdue in 2007. And so I had those sources in that same office that I talked about earlier, the prosecutors, to go back and I could draw the story. My, my goal was to tell the story of the, the arc of the epidemic as I witnessed it landing, going back to OxyContin in 1996, and then telling it through the case and through those first people who were fighting back, the first doctors, Dr. Van Zee, and a bunch of activists and some of the early parents of the OxyContin dead. And then I pick up the story in Roanoke where I actually picked it up in the late, uh, in the early mm. teens uh, when I started writing about uh, Hidden Valley. And then uh, more recently I wrote about this heroin uh, ring that had landed in a little farm community that wasn't a distressed community that to me exemplified like this could happen here, it could happen anywhere. And that allowed me to talk about uh, mass incarceration and just the failed war on drugs um, because a drug dealer had landed in the small town and went from having a handful of known users to hundreds overnight. But really, without the overprescribing of opioids, this heroin epidemic doesn't exist. I mean, that's what started it. Purdue changed the narrative. We knew for most of the 1900s, because we had huge uh, opium morphine epidemic after the Civil War. We knew that opioids should only be used in cases of extreme pain, uh, cancer, end of life. And they flipped the narrative uh, with the introduction of OxyContin to say, no, these drugs are safe. The FDA allows us to make the squishy claim, which they then said was as, it, as if it was gospel, and uh, hired all these folks to sort of spread the gospel. Both of you have something in common here, I think which is um, you're writing books not to entertain, uh, not for a nice, uh, quiet, uh, snoozy Saturday afternoon lying on the couch. I think it's a great couch. beach read. I think it's a great <laughs> <laughs> you, you, These are acts of activism. You, 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 are, you are looking for change. You are, you are ringing a bell in a, in a, in a literate and, and a journalistically interesting way. And I'm curious, again, because of your different perspectives on this, um, how is it, how comfortable is it for you as a journalist who's supposed to sort of be kind of vaguely, um, if not uh, objective, at least kind of fair, you know, um, to step out as an activist. You have, you have something you'd like to accomplish here. Um, yes, I think our job is to hold power accountable. And there are so many failures at every level in the story. So many failures, the doctors, the drug companies, the FDA, the DEA, Congress, the NECAP, the DEA, on and on and on. Um, and it was initially kind of uncomfortable, but I, 
started being interviewed, you know, <laughs> NPR, asking me what I think about the crisis. And um, so I had to sort of step into this um, activist slash expert role that mm -hmm. nobody trained me how to do. But um, I feel that uh, having spent seven years um, sort of in the thick of this and getting this view that a lot of people don't have, I feel this responsibility to, to say what, I, what I'm seeing on the ground. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you haven't let go of this. No. <laughs> no. It's, it's, it's not too, solved yet. Yeah. yeah. I just read today, it's not supposed to even plateau. They were saying sometime after 2020, now they're saying 2025. Still going to keep going up till 2025. I'd like to get your answer to that because, of course, you're supposed to be, you know, Mr. Peer Review, Mr., you know, but you're, you've got an agenda. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I would like to not call it an agenda, but I have a view that I think is right, and when you recognize <laughs> it. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. And numbered bullet points, That's and right. I think that makes it an agenda, That's right? right. So, yeah. Um, so I, I have a, a joint, fac uh, an affiliate faculty appointment at something called the Center for Public Health Advocacy mm -hmm. at Johns Hopkins and Bloomberg School of Public Health. And a lot of academics would be incredibly uncomfortable with that. A faculty appointment in public health advocacy. Uh, I'm not uncomfortable in the least. And I've thought a lot about this and I'll tell you why I'm not uncomfortable. So before I, I got to opioids and pain, I was thinking a lot about climate change. And there was this really interesting thing happening over the early part of my career as I was finishing my PhD and started publishing that climate change scientists like Michael Mann mm -hmm. uh, were really stepping forward and saying, I'm not just gonna tell you the science, I'm gonna tell you what's right, what we have to do, because you're not doing your job, right? Because I know these things, I know the world <laughs> is pointed at catastrophe, and sure, the job was, to, the division of labor was supposed to be easy, right? I give you the data, and then you policymakers and politicians figure out the right thing to do and you actually do it. You're falling down on the job, so I'm gonna have to do all of it for you, right? And I really thought that that was pretty uh, powerful and pretty plausible as a response by an academic, but I have even less compulsions about it than someone like Michael Mann, because my job was never to be objective in the same way that he was. Mm -hmm. I'm an ethicist. And my conclusions are not descriptive, they're normative. And what that means is I'm trying to come up with arguments that are logical and justified, hopefully sound, good logical word for you, right? The premises are true and it follows uh, the, the rules of logic. But the conclusion is you ought to do something. We ought to do something. The country would be better if. Doctors would live up to their obligations if, right? That's what I do for a living. And so now I actually flip it on its head a little bit when I think about aren't you uncomfortable being an advocate? I'd be uncomfortable not being an advocate because my job is to figure out what we ought to do. And if I figured out what we ought to do and it was just like, yeah, you all take it from here, then I'd just feel like a hypocrite, right? I would feel like I'm lazy or relaxing in my ivory tower. So why did I write a trade book instead of an academic book? Because I want change. And look, uh, my colleagues are stepping up and they're responding and I'm presenting this at academic conferences and talking to doctors. They're doing the thing that I want them to do, which is taking it seriously as an argument. But I'm also getting other people to read. And we're not gonna change our response to the drug overdose epidemic unless an entire nation of people steps up and says, we're tired of our family and friends and loved ones dying. Uh, let's do something about it. So I don't have any strong feelings about this, as you can see. <laughs> uh, Dan in the darkness there has a question. Hi. Uh, yes, in an effort to encourage uh, further questions, I'll, I'll ask yes, the first please. one. Uh, so uh, speaking of, of normative, uh, y there's a bunch of journalists in the, in the audience here who would really like to cover this story. Uh, but they need fresh takes for a, 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 a story that's been around for a very long time. As you guys make clear, you know, you could go back to the Civil War uh, or, or older. Uh, and you could certainly talk about the last 25 years or so, the, what was actually a resurgence of heroin mm -hmm. from the, early, with the earlier peaking in the 60s. Anyway, people need fresh takes. And, and so the, and there are, that would come in two forms, I guess. One is just sort of corrective stories that correct story, you know, ideas that are out there that are wrong. 
and the other would be new things that are arising based on changing circumstances, changing laws. So how about some fresh angles, some fresh ideas about what uh, reporters are, o are overlooking on, on this and where, where you think there needs to be uh, more scrutiny, more stories? Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Beth? Yeah, I've got some thoughts on that. Um, so especially in smaller and medium-sized markets as jobs go away and there are fewer people to tell the stories. What I see happening in Roanoke, which is a uh, region of about a quarter of a million people, is I seeing reporters f rely too much on um, the traditional beat sources like cops, courts, um, not even health as much. And my goal now is to tell stories of, around the solutions to this crisis, which are largely where public health and the court system and our criminal justice system, uh, this, this, this gaping hole in the middle and where people fall into that hole is when they die. And so I'm writing about people who are out there pushing the boundaries. I have a story come out in the Atlantic in a couple months about a woman who's figured out, she thinks, how to crack the code on rural MAT. MAT is very medication-assisted treatment. Thank you. Uh, is, uh, can be controversial, especially in rural conservative communities, uh, many of which have higher overdose rates, partly because they don't have as much health care there. And so she's learning how to get judges and probation officers and police officers to start to treat these people who their whole adult lives are just circling, cycling in and out of jail. They're coming out of jail. They're getting on probation. They're not getting any MAT. They're not getting any mental health care. And then they have a dirty drug screen and they go right back to jail. And she's figured out a way around it. And it's pretty amazing. And she's doing it through Indiana Medicaid. Um, she basically set up a nine hour a week uh, intensive outpatient treatment inside the courthouse, which forced the judges and the probation officers uh, to get to know these people and to get to get, for them to get to know uh, the social workers and the healthcare people that she employs. And there was a, so it was so I'm, I'm out there and I'm trying to find where the edge of change is, and that's what I would suggest to you. Instead of just try to find somebody who's doing something really difficult and uh, using the best science. And, but is figuring out a way to get around that cavernous gap where people die. And maybe it's um, a, a group that has talked a police chief into allowing a syringe exchange in a community. It's still very controversial in many areas. When you're in New York, maybe you don't see that as much, but um, in much of the rest of the country, the idea of a syringe exchange in some of these places where overdose rates are highest is just, they can't, they can't abide by it at all. So that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. So, Travis, from where you stand, what are the, to use your very nice phrase, the cavernous gaps in coverage that, that we might be able to exploit with fresh angles and stories? Yeah, so I think that my answer rhymes a lot with Beth. So I was telling her before we started that um, I was just really struck by the last third or so of her book as she does this really impressive thing, which is she starts to weave the public health evidence into these stories with people um, who will, won't always accept the sort of evidence that she's presenting to the reader. And so this comment about, you know, a lot of the country syringe exchanges are still um, pretty philosophically scary. So here, here's the word to put to it, it's harm reduction. Harm reduction is still really scary in this country. Um, the, the part of this story that I think we don't have to talk about a lot more is pharma and distributors and like we're gonna have to keep covering the news um, but you know Purdue going bankrupt isn't gonna solve the problem right um, if McKesson or CVS pays billions of dollars that's not gonna solve the problem we have two and a half million people plus living with opioid use disorder and we have good evidence on how to keep them alive so I'm gonna say something that if you've never thought about this I want you to just like hold in your head and take home with you you do not have to die from an addiction to opioids. This is not a fatal condition in the right circumstances. You die from an addiction to opioids 
because they're stigmatized, criminalized, you're driven to the shadows, you're driven to the corners, right? What's the evidence for this? The evidence is when we open safe injection sites, not we, the Americas, because we don't do that, or we, US, right? Um, the first safe injection site was opened in Vancouver. The first safe injection site in North America was opened in Vancouver in 2003. They've had millions of injections supervised in a healthcare space with naloxone on hand, oxygen on hand. How many people have overdosed? Thousands. How many people have died? Zero. You absolutely don't have to die from an addiction to opioids. And this is amazing because there are other drugs that if you have an addiction to, the, our ability to reverse overdoses is really limited. Our ability to give medication is really limited. We have medication that works, we have harm reduction that works, and now we go back to this last third of Beth's book that I was talking about. We have a huge part of the country that is facing the most tragic aspects of this crisis. They're touched daily by people who are dying, and the evidence isn't infiltrating, and I don't know what to do. They still see them as bad people. They, well, there's some of that seeing, but, but even, you know, I talk to a lot of people who of course don't see their children as bad people and they lose their children. <laughs> but you can lose a child and still think that it's wrong to enable drug use and if you give them a place to do drugs, you're enabling it. And, and there, there has to be a conversation about how do we move forward in a way so that using opioids isn't a death sentence in a country where a whole bunch of people won't embrace the policies that will actually fix it. And I don't have the answer. I'm like, I'm like crowdsourcing now. I'm like, this is my research. <laughs> this is what I'm writing now. I don't have the bandwidth to solve this on my own. The more the merrier, right? Like, let's figure this out. That's, that's but what But there I'm are these little wins that are happening and they're so exciting to write about. Uh, I told you about Nikki's program in Indiana. Um, the hospital system where I live in Roanoke, it's the large nonprofit hospital system, six different hospitals in the western half of the state, largest employer. And when I, the first time I interviewed the head of the ED for these six hospitals, 2017, uh, he said, I don't believe in medication assisted treatment. I think it's treating a drug with another drug. I don't think it's within the purview of my ED and, and I'm sorry, ED. emergency department. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but the science, and I, mean, I, I was, wasn't as firm about it then, but I'm, I have it recorded, so I've, I've listened to it recently. And, and he said, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Recently, uh, they've gone back and they've looked at the data and they've totally flipped their policy around. So now if a young person like Tess shows up in the ER, they don't just Narcan her and send her back on the streets. They uh, give them buprenorphine in the ER, which Yale just started doing not that long ago, MGH in Boston, it's pretty cutting edge still. And so when I say to him, uh, and then they get them into outpatient treatment, which they beefed up, within the first month they had 24 people into treatment that they hadn't had before, and it was the same thing as the court. It was the same people they were seeing over and over, and they're having success. And I said, Dr. Burton, you said it was treating, he goes, yeah, I know. I said, what happened? He goes, well, we read your book, <laughs> and, and then we looked at the data, and we said, how can we not be doing that? And I said, what's it feel like to know that you potentially saved 24 lives in one month? He said, I feel like doing cartwheels every day, mental cartwheels. And so one of the things I say when I go out and talk, and maybe the old newspaper journalist Beth Macy wouldn't have done this, but one of the things I say when I speak to a group, I say, if you know a drug court judge, if you know a probation officer, uh, if you know uh, a doctor, somebody, a gatekeeper in our public health, in our criminal justice system, talk to them. Because once they start to see uh, that they're having success, it gets really exciting and they love their job again. And they can make a difference. But people are so, afraid, I mean, and I find myself saying, like, didn't be, used to be my job to go out and tell people what I thought they should do, just like it didn't used to be Dr. Burton's job to do buprenorphine in the ER just because it wasn't your job a year ago doesn't mean it shouldn't be your job now, and maybe that shouldn't be my job, but I'm having these conversations mm -hmm. all the time with people I'm interviewing. You know, they're, they're in, the, in the early uh, days of this uh, opioid, what we, what we call opioid, uh, epidemic, um, you know, there was there was a, a bit of a backswell that where you, 
people would say, well, this is great. So now it's affecting, you know, small town white people. Um, and it's a big national problem that we should all do something about. Uh, when it was a heroin epidemic, you know, up in Harlem or in other uh, uh, inner city neighborhoods, it was just simply a terrible criminal thing. And we should just jail those people uh, and withhold treatment as kind of part of the punishment package. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you broker that legacy in, as you approach this subject? I mean, do you, do you recognize that I as do a thing? recognize that. Absolutely. I mean, African Americans were initially protected from the opioid epidemic because of racism. Doctors didn't uh, trust them to responsibly take opioids. And uh, more recent data is showing now that, um, that there are more overdose deaths in the inner cities now because African Americans are getting well, larger, people of color getting um, heroin that's been cut with more fentanyl and also they're less likely to call 911 because of policing issues. Yeah. So, um, so, sure you have I, so yeah. we've identified now, like more. you've mentioned, like, like, three different national epidemics of opioid related misuse. You mentioned the morphine uh, uh, opium thing after the Civil War. We just uh, alluded to the uh, heroin epidemics uh, in the inner cities of the 50s and 1960s. And now uh, small town America is struggling with this. You know, what's the problem here? If you don't, you know, wh wh what is it that journalists and policy ethicists um, are unable to do, if I can blame the two of you because you're here, um, that uh, would drive the lessons of these things home. I mean, now you're talking about 100 years of very hard experience. Is this about <coughs> our attitude toward drugs? Is this about our attitude toward addiction? Is this about our attitude toward pain? Yeah, all of those. Um, so look, I'm really glad you brought this up. It's a big part of the, the last third of my book, every, every talk that I give, it has to be said that our response to the drug overdose crisis is laced with racism and classism. And if you don't acknowledge that, you're perpetuating it. And if you don't look forward and say, how do you respond to this without contributing to that legacy of racism and classism, then you're part of the problem. And so one of the things that I think we have to do is we have to recognize that people take drugs for reasons. And when I say this, I've given a bunch of academic talks where people with PhDs, people in various disciplines in the audience have said, sure, you're saying this very politically correct thing where we started responding to the crisis because white people in the suburbs and the small towns started dying, but let's acknowledge a difference. When it was in the inner cities, it was heroin, it was taken illicitly, and when it was the white people in the suburbs, it was OxyContin prescribed by their doctor and they had reason to treat it. And I said, if that's our starting point, we're in serious trouble making reparations for these terrible decisions that we've done because people take drugs for reasons, we take Oxycontin for reasons, we take heroin for reasons. What is heroin? Heroin's an analgesic. It was patented by Bayer in 1898 as a replacement for morphine. It works really well in exactly the same way that oxycodone and hydrocodone and hydromorphone and fentanyl work. And if you, <laughs> the most heartbreaking stories I've ever heard is that people say, uh, I started taking heroin. Yes, I started with heroin. I was taking it because it was easier to get and cheaper than going to a doctor and getting painkillers, right? So people take p pills for reasons. And if you think that starting with Oxycontin makes you a different kind of person than starting with heroin, then I think we're probably starting with some biased assumptions that we really ought to reflect on, right? Um, these drugs cause some people problems. They don't cause other people problems. And we have to be really clear that when we move forward, the goal is to repair what we've done in the past and respond in a way that's not discriminatory. It doesn't solve just the epidemic in the suburbs. It solves the epidemic everywhere. I have a question. <laughs> so my question actually dovetails nicely with what you were saying, Travis, about people taking drugs for a reason. So I think for a long time, there's been an assumption that sobriety was the end of the road in terms of addiction treatment. Could you step a little bit more into the yep. mic? Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and obviously, in getting access to medication-assisted treatment, there's a lot of triaging happening. Just making sure that that's possible in a lot of places is the edge of change, as Beth was describing. And so 
What I'm wondering is, do we have any sense longitudinally of what the outcome is going to be for people in medication-assisted treatment, and if there's something beyond that that we could be pushing for as well? And if medication-assisted treatment is our best option, is it the only option, and is it a magic bullet? Is that to me or to either of To both. Uh, you go, yeah, please. then you go. Because I know you were working just on the... Yeah. Uh, what's the word? This thing you were just doing this week. Oh, yeah, the yeah. opioid vaccine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, but, well, but, okay. So I want to pivot to that, yeah. but first I just want to clarify that the science is really clear that uh, you're 60, 65% more likely not to overdose, relapse, die, uh, if you're taking medication-assisted treatment. And I had a researcher call me out at a talk I was giving in Kentucky, said, don't call it MAT, don't call it medication-assisted treatment, call it medicine. It's medicine the way a diabetic would take insulin. And often, perhaps for the rest of their life. Uh, the science isn't yet clear uh, on duration. We do know that the, the longer people stay on it, uh, even when they come off after they've been on a long time, they're still at more risk of relapse and overdose. I see it over and over again in my book. Um, versus uh, abstinence only, which is about, they're not even sure, they think it's about six to eight percent. So. Uh, I mean, what I say, if it, if it was my child, mm -hmm. I would want them to have yeah. that medicine. Did you want to share something you were doing this week? You said... Uh, well, I'll, I'll add to this first. Um, I think the straightforward answer to your yeah. question is people should get access to the medication that works for them, no questions asked, on demand. And what the data that Beth was just sharing is that right now the gold standard is medication for, for OUD, so MOUD or MAT. Um, there is an abstinence-based medication, it's called naltrexone, and you have to be abstinent first, otherwise it casts you into withdrawal, because when you have naltrexone on board, what it does is it keeps the opioids that you put into your body from, injecting, uh, from interacting with your opioid receptors. So you cannot get high if you have naltrexone on board. And so people really like that. Law enforcement really likes Law it. Law enforcement, the Justice it's, Department, they really it. like this drug because it's abstinence-focused. And I do not care if somebody's abstinent if they don't care, right? The long-term data question is a really good one. We don't know what happens to you if you're on buprenorphine for 40 years. That's a really important piece of data that we don't have, we should be collecting, uh, that will go into the hopper with pros and cons about going on medication. But the most important thing that I wanna say is that if staying on medication for longer keeps you alive, it's obviously the right thing to do for you, right? And then a lot of people will want to taper off. They'll eventually want to taper off methadone or buprenorphine because they don't particularly like the experience of being on it um, because they feel like it would be better for them somehow if they didn't. And that's also within their rights. But menu, on demand, whatever's right for you, right? The, the thing that Beth was talking about is I just came down from Syracuse where I was participating in a, a working group on the ethics and regulatory issues around uh, what's called an opioid vaccine. So there's uh, in the going into clinical trials, there's something that they're calling a heroin vaccine. And basically, I just gave you like my talk that I gave them, which is, I'm really suspicious of our love affair with abstinence-based programs. And so yeah. the, the idea of an opioid vaccine sounds great to the Justice Department and law mm -hmm. enforcement. Um, so like, yay, a vaccine, that means you can't get high and you won't be affected. It's yeah. not a vaccine. It just keeps the drug from interacting with your body or it reduces its effectiveness. Um, I don't think there's a particular moral valence with drug use. I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hand because there's stigma around it, but just think if you or anyone you know is on an SSRI or SNRI for depression or anxiety, guess what, those, cause, those drugs cause dependence, which means if sure. you take them away, they cast you into withdrawal. I take Lexapro every day, I've done it for 15 years. 12 hours after I forget my dose, I start to have my head spin, right? There's no stigma around my taking Lexapro every day um, because it's not seen as a drug of abuse. If you have to take buprenorphine every day to make you healthy and do well, it's a great drug for you. So I'm hearing biochemistry stories. I'm hearing neuroscience stories. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing um, sociology stories. Actually, uh, I've, I've heard like five stories just in the last 15 minutes. But both of you now, you, you've answered the question by telling us what policy you like. I guess what I'd be interested in hearing specifically, I can make things up, but I'd like to hear from you. 
Okay, what's the story that you should do to advance that policy that you two believe in? Okay, so you just did this piece for Atlantic that's going to come in a couple months, and I appreciate your sharing that with, with us. But when you go back to Roanoke, when you go back to the, actually, I guess it's right outside of Roanoke, right, where you live, what's the story that's in that community that you know so well, having already told so many stories, what's the story that you can tell that advances that policy that you want to see enacted? Well, a story I'm noodling right now, I was, I, I go all around the country talking about the book, and usually when I go to a rural area, there's not enough access to MAT. But I went to this little town in North Carolina, uh, which is called Mount Airy. It's oh. Mayberry. Mm -hmm. It's the Andy Griffith show, fictional town. Uh, very much uh, still exists around this mythology of the 50s Wilson <coughs> era. and. Unlike every other small town I've spoken at, they actually have a lot of positions for MIT that go unfilled. They can't get people to get it. And when they looked at it, uh, what was going on with, they have the highest overdose rate in North Carolina, and they can't get people into this treatment that they've all set up. And the issue was they were living too far out, and they, it was a simple transportation issue. It was one part of it, the other part was stigma. So I am following um, the guy who's been hired to turn around uh, this town that has, I mean, I can't believe it has the highest overdose rate in North Carolina, Mayberry, right? So they hire this guy who is former DEA, uh, uh, law enforcement, Marine Corps, comes out of retirement to take this opioid response job is totally on board with harm reduction and all the science can recite it as well as you and I can. And he can't get anything done because uh, he has a meeting, he calls all the churches together, they say, we'll take people, we have these church vans, we'll take them to treatment. And some lady like hijacks the meeting with, well, I think when they relapse, we should just let them die and take their organs. So he's running into that stereotype right and left that you all don't see in New York, but I see it out in, uh, I want to say the real world, all the time, <laughs> all the time. And he has a sheriff that is spending $750,000 a year to incarcerate extra inmates in the next county over. And he's got, uh, and uh, doesn't want to do buprenorphine in the jail because he's trying to raise money to build a new jail. It's that whole in, uh, incarceration budget and law enforcement and criminal justice system trumping the moralism, trumping the science every time. So for you, it's a profile. No, it's it's. I mean, it's it's a profile, but it's 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 really getting into the psychology of this and showing people um, what works and and what doesn't work. And and yes, I, I hope to follow him over time and see the community start to see the kind of changes that I was talking about, Dr. Burton doing cartwheels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the story that's happening um, all over America, and I've found this particular, um, I think, illuminating kind of place to okay, write about. Okay, okay. So now, uh, are you going to retreat back into the peer-reviewed literature, or what's, what's the story that you can tell that will advance your sense of solution? Uh, well, I have to do both all the time because I do like to have a job. Um, <laughs> so I do have to keep doing that peer-reviewed thing, but, but no, I will keep telling stories also. So let me, let me cheat a little bit. Let me actually start a new story that's, that's more than what we've talked about so far. So I mentioned earlier that one of our problems is that we're not just, we didn't just over-prescribe pills for a long time and start a uh, spark, a new epidemic. Um, we're also simultaneously now under-prescribing. And so one of the things I describe in the book and every talk that I give to clinicians is that we are so bad at pain that we do this simultaneously in every clinic and every hospital in the country. And so in the single hospital after my fifth surgery, I was denied more pain medication by a stigmatizing, judgy NICU attending, or uh, not NICU. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been interesting. Uh, <laughs> ICU attending. Um, and then three hours later, prescribed into oblivion, th that started me down the road towards dependence and withdrawal. 
And so this, this fact that we're doing both at the same time means that we are completely incapable of responding to pain nu with nuance, mm -hmm. responsibly, uh, with compassion. And so I go around and I talk to doctors and I talk to hospital administrators and they will actually try to tell me that you can't have doctors do this with nuance, that, that they're not good at nuance, that the, that the pendulums either give opioids out like candy or withhold them. And I'm like, well, if they can't do it medicine with nuance, they're in the wrong freaking business, right? Because it turns out pain is hard to treat. I don't know if you realize this, pain is complex, right? Pain is really hard, it's hard to think about, it's hard to get straight about, and it's also really hard to treat. Also, something that we didn't recognize for a long time, opioids are really hard to understand. Pharmacology is really complex. The side effects are really interesting and unpredictable. You know what we just learned? Being on opioids can make your pain worse. Like we literally just learned this in the last five years. I mean, we had like a signal in the noise for a long time, but now we think this is really common. Okay, that was a lot of preamble. <laughs> Here's a bunch of stories. Yeah. We're enacting policies all over the country that's hurting some of the most vulnerable people. Pain patients, people with disability, people like suffering every day are being denied access to care. And some of them maybe shouldn't have been prescribed opioids in the first place, but we had this problem where we gave opioids to everyone, but now they have this incredible dependence, they have this incredible tolerance, and they're just being cut off and abandoned. Those stories aren't getting picked up. Mm -hmm. The people who are trying to tell those stories are the people affected and no one's listening. They're screaming into the void. They screamed loud enough for long enough with a few of us trying to tell those stories that recently the CDC and the FDA both issued a corrective, a real sort of like, hey, that whole thing where you stop prescribing just cold, like ham-fistedly, you can't do that to patients. And those mea culpa kind of corrections are not having any effect. We're enacting more and more ham-fisted policies that are hurting some of the most vulnerable, marginalized communities. There's a bunch of stories that need told. I would love the airwaves to just be flooded with stories about you can't solve an opioid crisis, a drug overdose crisis, by just not giving any pain care with any nuance or compassion. What, how many hours did you say the average doctor has training in medical school for pain? Seven. Seven. Seven or nine hours, yeah. So, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, <laughs> no, say that, say that like, let us hear that. Yeah, so um, this study is now several years old, but it's something like seven or nine is the average number of hours that physicians get on pain education in medical school. The study was actually done at Johns Hopkins before my time. Um, but about half of medical students come out with zero hours mm -hmm. wow. because pain education isn't required as part of the mandatory education curriculum. And is mm -hmm. that part of what you're doing when you speak to medical groups trying to get that number bumped up? Yep, mm -hmm. got it. I have a question very patiently waiting to be asked. Um, so in a world where you get rid of all the kind of like judgment and bias that are built into reasons why we don't deal with this effectively and like give people medication assisted treatment, do you think that our healthcare system the way it exists now could accommodate the need for medication assisted treatment and all the people who if there were no barriers besides it, like I don't know, if there were none of the kind of like social or stigma <coughs> related barriers, do you think that we could treat all those people? You don't think so? Not even close. And yeah. is it is it because of like gaps in coverage? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we well, still have 14 states that haven't passed the Medicaid expansion. But I would still say, and I think you said this in my paperback uh, version, that uh, stigma is still the number one. Oh, sure. Uh, blocker to turning this crisis back because everything falls under it in one way or another. Um, well, and, and stigma is part of the reason that those gaps exist, right? So um, if we magically got rid of the stigma, that by itself wouldn't do everything, but what it would do is it would start us to allow us to actually fill in. So the Surgeon General's report came out a few years ago and said one in 10 people with substance use disorder actually get specialty treatment. So we have a failure rate of 90% for this health condition. Just think about whether any other health condition that we would just be cool with that. Like 90% of you aren't gonna get care, right? So it's infrastructure, 
it's education. Like we need just a whole bunch more doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs and people who can do this, mm -hmm. right? So we have to fill in the infrastructure gap. We have to fill in the, the education gap. Now, stigma is a block to all of that, right? That's part of the reason that it's underfunded. Un, you know, people aren't interested in going into it. They don't want to deal with it. Doctors looked at me in withdrawal didn't want to touch me with a 10 foot pole. I instantly became a hot potato, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the number one consideration, but if it magically went away, we have to rebuild the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's no small task. <laughs> Just a little thing. Yeah, so we've talked a lot um, about treatment. I'm really interested in prevention. So how we have millions of young adults who have grown up thinking that this is the way of life, specifically in rural America, uh, how do we change the narrative for them that this isn't the way of life uh, and prevent them from using opioids in the first place? Beth, why don't you take that as our representative of rural America? <laughs> um, well, the, the, the data that came out after the Trump election showing the, the states where there, there were the reddest states and also happened to be the places that had some of the higher opioid overdose rates uh, were places where the workforce participation is really, really low. And one of the things I did is I was pulling those three communities together mm -hmm. that when I decided I had these three buckets of geography that represented three different phases of the epidemic is I got a sociologist to pull all the data, census data, comparing this distressed coal mining community with the city I'm from, which is fairly vibrant, with a not distressed farming community. And the data was so clear that in areas where uh, men mainly, the, the, the workforce participation rate among middle-aged men is really plummeted in rural areas. So it's, um, we've got to start with education, better education. There's a story in my book where a seventh grader in Appalachia is asked what he wants to be when he grows up. And he tells his teacher a drawer. And she says, oh, you want to be an artist? And he says, no, I want to draw disability. It was the only thing he can imagine for himself because it was what he saw being modeled. And hmm. so, I mean, if you haven't been to Appalachia or to a distressed rural community in some time, you'll, you'll be shocked. And we, we, my friend Robert Guype, who's an artist from Harlan, Kentucky, he, he gave a TED Talk recently about reparations mm. in Appalachia. Mm. Uh, he, you know, he says, we've got art projects. Purdue can fund some of our art projects in Appalachia. Um, but one, one of the things he's trying to do is just to create art uh, based on the storytelling model that's always been strong in Appalachia. He collects stories, oral histories, of people who've been affected by this. And then they, uh, he writes plays, and they perform them in, in a, a, a theater group called Higher Ground, which is amazing. Um, so you have people on stage telling stories about the opioid crisis as a call for conversation, but these are actually people in recovery themselves and public mm -hmm. defenders mm -hmm. working on their behalf. And um, there's just so much work that needs to be done um, in terms of education <coughs> and um, making these places <coughs> vibrant again. Did you have something you'd want to contribute? To uh, I think that's, that's a lot of it. Um, if we're thinking about prevention. Or changing the narrative, I think is what she was asking. You know? Yeah, so one of the things that, that the US is really good at in terms of thinking about, <laughs> good at is the wrong way to put it. <laughs> one of the things we yeah. focus a lot on when it comes to prevention is supply. And so we say we need to prevent addiction, we need to prevent drug overdose. The way to do that is to stop the supply from flowing in. Now, especially if you think that the story of the drug overdose crisis is a story of supply, that we flooded communities with pills and heroin and that's what killed everyone, then you think the solution is supply. One of the things that I think Beth is drawing out really nicely is that there's another side to this, it's demand. Right, so let's, let's use our full economics picture here. If we're gonna use the language of supply, there's another half. So, I'm, now I'm a broken record. I said a while ago, people take drugs for reasons. People take drugs for reasons. It's a really important question. What are the reasons? What are the reasons people take drugs? So quick anecdote for why supply doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, the second highest per capita prescribing rate of opioids in the world goes to Germany. So it's the US, clear and away, right? And then Germany. How big is Germany's problem with addiction and overdose? Very, very small. 
not only is it very small, but over the last four decades, as we've had all these changes in pharmacotherapies and different prescribing patterns or whatever, it hasn't changed at all. Their addiction and overdose rate has been low, is low, hasn't changed in 40 years. Here's a really important question, y'all. What are they doing that's so different from us, right? Here's a hypothesis, not a whole lot of data, just speculation. Uh, healthcare, you know, lack of endemic poverty, hope, like, you know, looking towards the future. The places in the U.S. that have been hit hardest by the drug overdose crisis have these features of not seeing a whole lot of other things to do with your life, right? I know what it feels like to take opioids. I know how good it feels. I know how bad it feels when you stop. The reason I was able to stop taking opioids is because I had a one and a half year old daughter who meant absolute world to me, a supportive partner who dragged me across the finish line, and a support system like nobody's business. That's how I got across the finish and line. An amazing job. And an amazing job and all these things to look forward to. I wanted to be a faculty member. I wanted to be productive at all the stuff I trained my whole life for. Take all that away and what happens to me? I can tell you what would happen to me. I would have kept taking those pills because they felt really good and stopping really sucked. Right? So why do people take drugs? They take drugs for reasons. Let's figure out what those reasons are and try to change that. Right. Right? Try to change the demand. Sir, you've been patient. This is, hi, this is a question from Twitter, actually, and we've kind of glanced at it throughout the evening, but we'll take it head on. Do you think patients' trust in doctors has declined as a result of the opioid crisis? Did we all hear that? Patients' trust in doctors declined? Do you want yeah. me to? Yeah, yeah. that's your, yeah. that's your, <laughs> that's that's well, your ball. I want to hear both. I want to hear both. Um, my trust in doctors has declined. Yeah, um, uh, yeah sure. Uh, so one of the things that I hear a lot from patients is um, they reach out to me now that I have this kind of uh, public persona as claiming to know something about it and say, I'm going in for knee replacement surgery. My doctor is going to prescribe me 120 nor Norcos. Is that reasonable? The answer is it's not. But, um, but yeah, we're asking these questions about doctors because we've pulled away the mask and shown that this thing that we turn to them for all the time to treat our pain uh, is something that they have no background in, no training in, and they're completely ill-equipped for. Um, so, you know, it's declined, descriptively it has declined some, I've seen that. Normatively, it probably should decline, right? Like when it comes hmm. to treating pain and addiction, we've just made it super clear to the country that these two things that we need desperately, we are not good at. Yeah. Beth, how would you? Uh, well, I was addressing a group of doctors about four months before the book came out, and it was about two months after Tessa died. And I'm clutching this because I was wearing this necklace, not this necklace, but I had this necklace her mother had given me, which was a locket with her favorite poem that represented the way she felt about her son on the outside and a picture of her inside. And uh, they asked me to speak to this medical school panel uh, in, in the pl same place where they didn't want to do buprenorphine in the ED. And so I thought, well, this is my chance. And I was a little worked up. My voice maybe was shaking. And I said, I feel like any of you all who ever took a free item from a pharmaceutical company should feel morally compelled to become part of the solution. You know, should become wavered. We haven't talked about the waiver, but there's this pretty, uh, a lot of doctors say they don't want to do this eight hour training thing to get the waiver to become buprenorphine prescribers. It's a DEA approval. It's, it's not that much work. But a lot of them just don't want to do it because they don't want, quote, addicts in their waiting room. And what I said was, guess what? You all have, and I don't like to use that word, you, they're in your waiting room. Um, you maybe didn't directly cause it, but you participated in it. And more importantly, you should become part of the solution. And when I said this, the response was crickets. You know, and... Um, Four months later, they changed their tune a bit. So that was good, and that did make me feel good. And that you see that starting to spur other changes. Uh, I'm in sorry, our community. what happened four months later? So, so we that's got the crickets. Same, uh, uh, they, then they did start becoming buprenorphine providers. It was the same uh, health system that I was talking about earlier, where they now do buprenorphine in the mm -hmm. ER, where prior to that, they just didn't even want to discuss it mm -hmm. in a public forum and felt like I was calling them out. But now I would say they would be saying the same thing. I've got two I think two questions here waiting. 
Um, so I want to go to those, but I have, but I have a question, but I want to get in line. So please. Um, Beth, you mentioned this earlier that uh, a lot of times like the burden of this mainly falls on the families mm -hmm. of the people who are affected. What kind of policies would be needed to alleviate that? Because it just seems like so much of the time, like it's just impossible. Even if you have a supportive family, like there are just limits to what a, one family can do to help people. Right. Well, uh, one of the things, if more doctors were waivered to prescribe this treatment, then people like Tess that I wrote about wouldn't have to wait months and months to get an appointment and wouldn't have to go to a cash only prescriber. If she had had, met, if Virginia had passed Medicaid earlier, she would have had better chance at access. So those are all, all the things we've been talking about sort of fall within that rubric. No, that, I think okay. you said it. That's okay. So we've talked quite a bit about medication-assisted treatment and also touched on the preventive aspects, but I'm curious about what role you think mental health care plays in this crisis and the reasons that people are turning to these pills and to heroin as well. Um, Travis, you mentioned that there's much less stigma around SSRIs now than there has been in the past, and there's also an eagerness to prescribe them. Do you think there's a potential for the same kind of pill-happy approach in addressing the mental health aspect of this? Um, and also, if you got to be king of the U.S. healthcare system, how would you make that part of the solution? Oh boy, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to make super clear the stakes, right? The be some of the best predictors of whether or not somebody will develop a substance use disorder is psychological comorbidities. And so we have to have a really broad approach to mental health generally if we're going to address it at all. Um, I do worry about the pill happy approach, but not because I'm anti-pharmacology at all. It's because, so this is actually one of the next projects, but who knows when I'll get to it. Um, the same thing that I describe with opioids and, and to some degree benzodiazepines, so the drugs that we do highly stigmatize because they're drugs of abuse, um, the same problem that I identified when I first started working on this, that we prescribe them but, but then let them go. So there's a, a, a write and forget sort of mentality, like I have a DEA license, I can prescribe opioids, here you go, not on me to help you get off of them, right? Well, the same thing is actually true with psych meds. And so there's a lot of excitement about prescribing medications that um, the folks who are prescribing have much less education for actually doing a proper taper doing long-term management, knowing what to do when the medication eventually hits its tolerance ceiling and is not safe to prescribe more of anymore. So worried about the pill-happy approach, not because anti-pharmacology, but just because the same move is gonna have to be made here. It's gonna have to be holistic. It's gonna have to be super education focused. Then we need to have a, a sense of seeing the entire um, length of treatment, basically. I have a practical question. I very much appreciate the solutions and the, and the uh, uh, remedies that the two of you have been talking about. Um, but for you in particular, Beth, we're, we're all, some of us here, journalists, some of us are established, some of us are starting out. In the end, you're a freelancer. And how do you sustain yourself as a freelancer with a cause? I try to find really great stories that editors can't say no to. Um, and where those great stories align with my values, where this epidemic is concerned, is my jam, right? So I'm always looking for, lately, those stories. Um, I also sustain myself by speaking, like Travis does. We both have speaking agencies. Um, and uh, I, hope to continue writing books for the rest of my career. Um, it's been um, great. I l I've always loved long form, but when I was scrambling as a, a feature writer at a daily newspaper, um, you would work, 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 you know, so lucky if you get a month or six weeks to work on something. And then as soon as you were done, it would publish, and it was like, oh, what are you having for me tomorrow, you know? And so yeah. I really appreciate that not only do I get to work on something for a year, two years, two and a half years, then I get to go spend the next year talking about it, and, and in the case of this book in particular, learning more about 
um, the next step, the next phase, the solutions. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's been great. I, uh, I recommend it. Um, I seek out mentors a lot. I was at a narrative writing conference in Texas in July, which I don't recommend. Um, there were there were warning signs about snakes in the hotel lobby. Um, but I met Sonia Nazario, who sure. wonderful. She used to be with you guys, mm -hmm. right? The Wall Street Journal, who wrote Enrique's Journey, and I've been watching her go from newspaper journalist to uh, book writer to spends a lot of time giving activist speeches and now writes for the opinion mm -hmm. section, Sunday review section. And I was like, that's what I want to be in five years. So I, I sought her out. I, I, tr I kind of mm -hmm. create my own little um, support team. And I did it with the book. Uh, I've already asked Travis if I can interview him for my next project. Um, I'm just always looking for an opportunity that will help me um, find that sweet spot. You have helped us tonight, both of you, find the sweet spot in a terrifying and disconcerting national crisis. And the sweet spot is your commitment and your honesty and your integrity about the journalism that the two of you, each in your own way, has accomplished. Thank you so much for sharing it with us tonight. It's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.